Well, hey guys, I'm Nick, and welcome back to Cyphernetics. Well, finally, it is here. Star Trek Discovery Season 5, the final season of the show, has hit our TV screens. And I've got to say, this very first episode of the last season, it did not disappoint. In fact, I would go as far as to say this is probably one of the strongest season opener episodes we've had from Discovery. In past years, there's been a little bit of ups and downs and so forth with this storytelling out of Discovery, but I kind of feel this is on a really good track now. It, it, the, the episode had levity, it had excitement, it had action and adventure. The mystery and the, and, the, and the chase that they're on is an engaging one. It kind of felt like a bit of an Indiana Jones in space kind of routine uh, for this season opener, which I think was a really good direction to take for this show. We've, we've had a lot of uh, different storytelling styles over the course of Discovery, but I feel this season is kind of shaping up to be perhaps one of the strongest, based on this first episode at least. So today I'm going to go through this first episode of Discovery Season 5, Episode 1, entitled Red Directive. So this episode opens with a bit of a bang. We've got Burnham riding on the, the hull of the ship there at warp in her EV suit. And we'd seen these kind of clips before from previous trailers and sneak peek scenes and everything that Paramount had previously released. And I kind of thought, oh, yep, they're going to do the usual storytelling routine where they go, you know, 24 hours before or something to that effect. And yep, <laughs> within, a, within a minute or so, we get, uh, we get four hours earlier. Our Discovery crew members are at Starbase there. There's the anniversary of uh, the founding of the Federation. Uh, in uh, 2161. We've got cocktails going on, we've got Burnham and Tilly and Adira, Stamets, and we soon learned that uh, this spore drive is kind of being retired, or at least Starfleet isn't pursuing the technology of the spore drive any further. Brand new drive system called the Pathway Drive, which is essentially superseding it. Basically, Discovery will be the only starship to ever have the spore drive, which makes it unique. Let's face it, the spore drive was kind of like a bit of a unusual concept. I think the fact that they've kept the whole spore drive thing to, to Discovery alone and no other Federation ships is probably a good course of action. It was always a little bit weird in its concept and everything and it never really kind of got off the ground on on mass scale. So the fact that they're moving on with an, another sort of drive technology I think is a good thing. We've got Saru and Taruna having a bit of a dance there together at this function and we soon find out that uh, Saru has been offered the position of ambassador and he's going to have obviously a fairly high up position there in the Federation but in order to take this role he would need to resign his Starfleet commission become a bit more of a politician type. <laughs> so he's kind of toying up the uh, the pros and cons behind doing that. And now's when things start to get interesting as there's an urgent call for Burnham to uh, have a, a very quick meeting with Admiral Vance and Kovic in their kind of this sort of new thing which is called the Infinity Room which kind of is a bit of a I guess a Starfleet version of the Cone of Silence from Get Smart or something where they essentially uh, beam into some white void which I guess is sort of soundproofed and very secure in its location where they have a uh, discussion about having to track down this uh 800 year old Romulan ship that uh, it's it's being pillaged by raiders and whatnot and uh, and they've got to quickly get over there to rescue whatever on board this ship that uh, you know can't fall into enemy hands. And here we see Mole and Lark for the first time they board this old Romulan ship back at next generation era kind of vessel and we see them take off their helmets to reveal uh, their identities and everything and in this very first moment here there's something about Lark that is going to turn out to be quite different. His face was uh, undergoing a, a bit of a metamorphosis or he's kind of like a shapeshifter. I've always thought as in previous videos leading up to this season his appearance does seem like a bit of a, a mix of different uh, known Starfleet races. He's sort of like a you know a little bit Ferengi, he's a little bit Romulan, he's a little bit a, bit a bit of everything thrown into a bit of a melting pot which kind of reminded me of the same sort of technology as I've discussed in a previous video as to how uh, Idris Elba's uh, character was a bit like this in that Star Trek Beyond film where he was, you know, injecting himself with all these different races to do something to his a body or whatever to extend his life or something and as a result he kind of looked like a bit of everything. I wonder whether this is the same sort of thing with Lark or whether he's a shapeshifter. There's clearly going to be something about him that uh, we're going to find out later on that's quite important. Whatever it is they're hunting for is obviously very important because uh, Kovic has authorised the use of lethal force. We get uh, Owo and, uh, and Reese and Burnham there uh, boarding the Romulan ship but it isn't long before poor old Owo and <laughs> Reese get sidelined uh, in these sort of capture bubbles that, uh, that Mole and Lark shoot at them 
and we just get Burnham uh, kind of having a bit of a confrontation with them. When we saw the Romul on board the ship that they took the thing off, obviously, uh, you know, very cool that we got to see, uh, you know, that same sort of Romulan uniform that they wore in Next Generation era. So it's good we're getting a bit of historical accuracy here in this episode. Also, uh, a bit of new technology here we haven't seen before in terms of with the firefight that went on here on board the ship that uh, Burnham is using this uh, this phaser pistol, but with a bit of a, a push of a button, suddenly becomes a phaser rifle. Programmable matter technology that they use in the 32nd century uh, is good that you're able to, you know, swap between pistol and rifle and so forth uh, quite easily. So this is kind of a cool, uh, cool little gadget. They've stolen this puzzle box from this cloaked vault on board the Romulan ship. Lark throws a grenade which blows open a portion of the hull of the ship and Burnham gets ejected into space, which is where we kind of begin this opening for the the uh, the episode where we get you know Burnham attaching herself to the hull of their ship they're off to warp and Burnham's are stuck on the hull of Mullen Lark's ship trying to phaser out different components of their engine to collapse their warp field so that the ship drops out of warp before long we get Rainer he's the new foil to Burnham this season he wants to do things his way Burnham wants to do things her way and no doubt they're gonna butt heads in terms of their ways of doing things this is a pretty exciting sequence we obviously got a bit of action and a bit of excitement you know, starting the season off. Burnham convinces Rayner to back off. He releases the tractor beam on their ship. Burnham thinks they're going to be able to track their warp signature, but uh, not before they release a whole bunch of different probes going different directions and everything so that their warp signature can be uh, hidden amongst all these other different ones that are sent out at the same time. Obviously, Rayner delights in saying, I told you so to Burnham. He's obviously very strong-headed the same way that she is. And we kind of get the gist that uh, Moll and Lark are going to be a, a, a formidable Bonnie and Clyde antagonist pair for this season. And after all these different warp probes they have gone in, into warp there and they don't know how to track Moll and Lark's ship, Burnham knows somebody that can help with the situation and here we get Book brought back into the mix. Which kind of makes sense. He obviously was a, a pretty accomplished courier. He knows all the tricks in the trade and obviously it seems that Moll and Lark used to be couriers as well. So he knows the way they think, knows the different tactics and uh, and everything that they perhaps have used on multiple different career missions over the past. So he seems like a logical choice as a uh, consultant to bring in on this mission. So that at least seems like it's a plausible way to get Book back into the show. Because otherwise he'd just be off still doing his community service for Starfleet after what he pulled uh, last season to get himself kind of in a bit of trouble. When Book and Burnham are walking through the corridors of Discovery, there's a bloody Tribble just wandering around the hallways, climbing the walls and everything. It's like, what the hell is a Tribble just doing running loose on the ship? That seems like a potential dangerous situation. Book seems to be able to uh, narrow down the uh, the, the selection of, uh, of destinations that these guys have gone to, and they soon work out that they're off to a planet called Quamau. It's kind of like a interesting kind of Middle Eastern bazaar type planet, kind of uh, reminds me a little bit of a sort of a cross between Tatooine with some architecture that's a little bit like Naboo. So we've kind of got a little bit of maybe a mix of a couple of different sort of Star Wars kind of planets mixing together with a kind of a Tatooine meets Naboo sort of planet here in what we see as Quamau. And in another hark back to uh, the next generation era or whatever, we find out that our dealer, Fred, is a Sung android in exactly the same sort of model type as, uh, as Data. He has been built by Alton Sung back that we established his character in the first season there of Picard with the whole colony of, of synths and everything where we saw different Sung style androids living in that community. So it seems like Alton Sung has many different androids here that he's built. So I think this was kind of cool. We got to see a Sung style android in, you know, in the same sort of uh, model type as Data. That was that was a cool little addition here. And the fact that he's the kind of resident expert of the, uh, the time frame that they've got Got this artifact from the 800 years in the past kind of era kind of fits that it would be someone kind of you know around that sort of similar era we get a little scene here with tilly kind of crushing on a male crew member they've obviously been at the soiree and maybe had a bit too much to drink tilly's being her usual awkward self she's sort of you know crushing on this <laughs> this other crewman which I'm guessing is probably going to develop into something throughout the course of the season. And she's obviously t discussing her time as a teacher at Starfleet Academy, whether this is kind of setting up her involvement to uh, continue that role further down the track when we get to the Starfleet Academy series that obviously is going to be out in 2025. And Burnham being her usual uh, nosy self, wanting to know what exactly is going on with this Red Directive mission because Kovic has kept them significantly in the dark about what it's all about. Burnham gets Tilly to see if she can kind of hack into some Starfleet databases and trying to 
give her a, a bit clearer idea as to exactly what the mission is they're going on. It was cool that they uh, had a whole bunch of different sort of 800 year old tech that uh, Mole and Lark was trying to sell off to Fred the dealer. We've got self-sealing stem bolts which went back to sort of DS9 era with you know Nog and Jake were trying to offload a bunch of those at some point and isolinear chips and um, some old uh, you know phases that old tricorders and things like that uh, from the time period. So this was kind of uh, you know, a cool little addition uh, with all these little uh, bits and pieces that they're scavenging from old ships and everything. Android Fred manages to open up the, uh, the the Romulan mystery box, which was containing a notebook, which obviously contains a lot of drawings and notes and uh, and explanations and different analysis and everything. So the uh, the mission becomes to obviously retrieve this uh, this Romulan notebook by uh, left by one of the scientists on the Romulan vessel. We get a bit of a shootout there in Fred's room, and uh, this was clearly going to go down this way because yes uh, Fred was trying to undercut uh, more than Lark he was lowballing the uh, the valuation of the items in which uh, they were selling he wasn't going to give them back so this was never going to end well this, this scenario and we have, have a bit of a shootout bit of a fist fight here with Fred and his henchmen this episode is shaping up to be quite exciting we've got a lot of action and adventure and we've got a bit of mystery and a bit of uncovering some secrets and everything as well as a you know a good amount of, uh, of action to keep us engaged we've got Raina beaming down to the planet as well and joining Book and Burnham to track down Mole and Lark on these sand runners which are kind of like uh, speeder bikes meanwhile Tilly gets busted in her room trying to hack the uh, Federation database there to find out what the mission's going on about and Vance allows her to find out what she was hunting for. So we've got a bit of mystery going on here with the old Romulan scientist. We've got the bike chase going on down on the planet with uh, Book and Burnham and, and Rainer against Mole and Lark trying to escape from the, the planet. It's quite an exciting episode and this is really good. We're really getting into some exciting stuff here. And there's a bit of levity with the, you know, a bit of the dialogue or whatever. Had a bit of levity to it as well, which I think was really good. I think this was a really strong uh, sequence. Some of the bike chase stuff that with the Mole and Lark's ship, them, uh, you know, trying to work out how to thwart them. I was kind of really getting into it. I was like, this is, this, is a, this is a very cool opening to the season. One interesting thing during this bike chase thing, we had this moment where we get these comic panels popping up where we've got like a split screening between Burnham and Rainer and, and Book. And I'm not sure how I felt about these. It was sort of a, a very different means of storytelling uh, device that we sort of haven't really kind of seen in Star Trek before, this sort of comic panel look. When I first saw it, I thought, oh, this is kind of slightly jarring because it's not something you tend to see in Star Trek very much. I guess it did the job, you know, and it kind of at the same time created a little bit of visual interest and everything as well. So I think that was that was potentially an okay choice. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of let this one slide. I think the whole avalanche escape thing where they closed the tunnel, photon torpedoed the mountainside to create a massive avalanche. They had to outrun the avalanche. They had to also save the settlement at the same time. That was a really exciting sequence. There's only one part of this sequence which I kind of looked at and I thought, no, that's bullshit. I, 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 it was, <laughs> which was the bit when they had to use the two starships to uh, to basically use their shields uh, together to act as a, a, a big wall to prevent the settlement being hit by the massive avalanche. But in my mind, I'm thinking, oh yeah, the starships are going to have to come in, they're going to have to sort of, you know, roll onto their side and then put the shields up. But instead, both starships nosedived into the ground and essentially crashed into the planet, sticking out of the dirt which to me is like, no, no, I'm sorry, that that's rubbish. Like, if a starship flies into a planet and crashes nose first into the ground, it's going to break into pieces and can be completely destroyed. So that moment, I thought, I called BS on that. I would have much rather them see, see them fly in and then turn at the last second, create a wall and just be hovering in, in the air on their side as the uh, avalanche came in and, and hit. But but them to them to cr basically crash the ship's saucer section down into the dirt of the planet, kicking up a big wall of dirt and everything, and then uh, that kind of struck me as, no, no, that, 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 that doesn't seem, seem plausible to me at all. That's probably the one only part of this episode I looked at and I thought, that's not right. <laughs> Managed to uh, save the settlement, but obviously Mole and Lark escape at the same time. But luckily, obviously previously, they were able to beam the end 
Android back up to Discovery and plug his uh, positronic brain or whatever into the computer and, and scan back his memories from the, the last half an hour and basically retrieve the uh, the contents of the book that he flicked through and read, you know, very fast, fast like Data used to do when he was reading stuff. He would obviously have the ability to, to flick through stuff and read it very quickly. And they've managed to uh, get some information out of the book that they retrieved. To conclude the episode, we had a few DMs going on, but a deep and meaningful conversations. We had obviously one between Burnham and Bookdown on the planet at the end of the Sandrunner chase. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, Saru and Tarina back in Space Dock. Saru revealing that he wants to be with Tarina and be the ambassador. And Tarina proposes to Saru. So it seems like there's some wedding bells in the near future for Saru and Tarina. They work out their next uh, location is going to be this twin moon planet to find the next piece in the puzzle. And Kovic lets Burnham in on a bit of intel where we actually see the connection to the next generation episode, The Chase, where we saw this ancient race there that had basically scattered the DNA for all the life in the galaxy that preceded all of the races in the galaxy. They created the Romulans and the, and the humans and, the, and the, you know, the Klingons and everybody. It was done back in Next Generation era kind of time to kind of explain in a sort of offhanded way why all of our races in Star Trek all kind of look like humans with bumpy foreheads or pointy ears. Everybody kind of looks bipedal, two eyes, a nose and a mouth, but with slight variations on that. Where we saw a few images going back to Starfleet records of that episode with Jean-Luc Picard talking to the Romulans and everything and we realised that one of our Romulans, that they've stolen this information from was part of the away team there back in that episode and that he's uh, uncovered you know more detailed information as to exactly how the progenitors did their scattering of, of, of DNA across the galaxy to create life everywhere. Uh, a bit like the Genesis device, you can use the information for good and to, to create life out of uh, out of nothing, or you can probably use it as a weapon of mass destruction and kill everybody in the galaxy if you wanted to. So this is the reason they need these secret plans that they've stolen from this 800-year-old Romulan scientist back. So I think that's really cool that we got that hark back to that Next Generation episode. I always love it when we, uh, we get time ins from uh, from previous Star Trek. It always does, a, I think, a, a good service to particularly Discovery where you're trying to tie a show in that is set now so distantly in, in Starfleet's history, way forward in the 32nd century. Anything that I think grounds that and ties that back into Star Trek we've seen before is a good thing. So I think that was awesome that we got that connection uh, in this episode uh, uh, back to that old uh, The Chase episode of Next Generation. All in all, I think this was a really strong first episode of Discovery. I think it had plenty of action and adventure and excitement bike chases going on and running away from avalanches and shootouts and a bit of tie back to Star Trek of the past um, so I think this episode was probably I would say one of the stronger season openers that we've had in Discovery so hopefully this strong start will continue uh, as we go along the course of the season Star Trek Discovery season 5 uh, episode 1 Red Directive I really enjoyed it but let me know what you guys thought uh, leave a thought in the comments section and uh, be sure to uh, leave a like as well Guys, if you haven't subscribed to Cyphernetics yet, please be sure to do so. Click on that big subscribe button to stay current and up to date with all the latest Star Trek news on YouTube. And be sure to also check out my merch in the merch store. Plenty of cool Star Trek themed t-shirts and hoodies, mugs, caps, stickers. Plenty of good merch there. Always at good uh, discount prices and stuff as well. Uh, pick yourself up a bargain and help support the channel at the same time. Since we've had our first and, ep and second episodes drop simultaneously, uh, I'll be back tomorrow with my review for episode 2, Under the Twin Moons, of Star Trek Discovery Season 5. So be sure you uh, tune in for that. I'll see you then.